diverging paths in accountability for Donald Trump's failed coup and insurrection. And that includes some bad news for Trump in the RICO case today, where he just lost an effort to dismiss it, a judge rejecting the bizarre legal claim that indicted crimes would be okay because Trump claims they were his free speech. Now, that's not the actual law. In fact, plenty of crimes may include people talking. But the First Amendment does not protect words used for blatant criminal conduct, fraud, imminent threats, as the judge reminded Trump's lawyers. Now, that ru new ruling against Trump and that coup case, along with the other cases against Trump and the Gen 6 plotters, does show how, on one path in the courts, there are tough prosecutions and punishment for the coup. It's a court process that has escalated over time after the DOJ was initially slow to go up the line in these cases. You can come back to me. That's not the right... Yeah, I'll show you that headline in a few minutes, but... What I want to explain is, initially, you had all of the efforts around Jan 6 slowed down and delayed. They didn't even open an inquiry into the role of the leader and beneficiary of the plots to overthrow the election, Donald Trump, the election loser, for over a year. That was until Jack Smith took over. When Jack Smith took over the DOJ, then you had, of course, an acceleration of that process. And I think we've all lived through that. First, there was an effort to get it the top people who actually physically invaded the Capitol, many of them are now in prison. And some Trump aides have now been convicted. That's something we couldn't say this time last year. Other Trump aides await trial. One recently became the first White House aide to go to prison from a January 6th probe. So there's huge process on that legal track. Even as the current Speaker of the House goes farther than, well, any probably since the Civil War, to openly embrace convicted seditionists. And that's the other path. A Congress siding with convicts who invaded Congress. And we'll cover that part of the path in a moment. But here's the point I want to make in our kind of special report opening the program tonight. The wheels of justice are moving forward. After a slow start, we are seeing a lot of accountability on the legal path to deal with the insurrection. So I'm going to show you exactly what we're seeing on the evidence. And it starts very simple. We're going to fill up this chart for you over time, as we sometimes do. But it starts there with the very top of this chart, where after a slow start, the first conviction came about a year after the 2021 January 6th attack. In March 2022, a convicted attacker got a stern seven-year prison sentence. And that was the first time anyone was sent to prison for that. Then in the next year, for the first time, top aides and lawyers for Trump were indicted. Some were outraged about it. Others folded and pled guilty. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. They put me in handcuffs. They bring me here. They put me in leg irons. They stick me in a cell. And are you pleading guilty today because you agree that there is a sufficient factual basis, that there are enough facts that support this plea of guilty? How do you plead to count 15 conspiracy to commit filing false documents in indictment number 23SC188947? Guilty. So the courts went, as I mentioned on the far left, when it first happened, from nothing to slow to tough, working their way up the line over the years. And then, as everyone knows, Trump was indicted for January 6th conduct in two different jurisdictions. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6th, 2021, it was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government. That accountability has continued on the legal track. Mr. Navarro, who I mentioned there, is now, very recently, began serving a prison sentence after being convicted for hiding evidence about January 6th. And on the far right, you see the running count, 450-plus convictions for people who attacked the Capitol that day. And that court accountability is grinding on, even if people are used to the kind of talking points or memories of saying it initially started slow. These are just selected key points. This chart doesn't even include other measures like the victorious and painful defamation victory there against Giuliani for election lies and all the Trump lawyers facing disbarment proceedings, which can end their career 
and warn future coup lawyers of major consequences even before you get to a criminal trial. So after the slow start, you have the legal accountability for the coup. You have people who are now in trouble or in jail because they were trespassers or plotters or they were thugs attacking police or they were lawyers hiding evidence. And so the consequences and penalties from left to right over time have only gotten more real and severe for these people. And that matters, especially as a deterrent for future coup plotters. Let's put that up back on the screen. Yeah, this matters as legal accountability. We're seeing an opposite trend, though, in Congress and on the political side, where Republican leaders, or who were actually once critical of the convicts who stormed the Capitol, this is how they first sounded. This failed insurrection only underscores how crucial the task before us is for our republic. The violence, destruction, and chaos we saw earlier was unacceptable, undemocratic, and un-American. The Capitol was in chaos. Police officers were attacked. Guns were drawn on this very floor. A woman tragically lost her life. No one wins when this building and what it stands for are destroyed. Now that's how it started. You might notice those are some pretty top Republicans sounding emphatic. That was back when, in public, Kevin McCarthy sounded like Liz Cheney. And I told you tonight we we're going to walk through on the evidence these two paths. I showed you the court accountability path. Now I want to do the same thing and walk through our new reporting here based on all the evidence of the political path because it began here with Republicans condemning the obvious crime spree. What you see on the lower left is marking that over time. That is a quote from then Republican leader McCarthy. Democrats and independents, of course, join in the condemnation. They've stood by it through today. What's different, what we're charting here, is how Republicans over time went from calling that un-American and unacceptable to going soft on crime and the insurrection. Within a year, the National Party formally declared that it claimed January 6th was, quote, legitimate political discourse. And when that happened, that drew outrage over that lie in an effort to embrace and defend convicted seditionists and trespassers. Hard to imagine if al-Qaeda or ISIS stormed the Capitol that a year or two later you'd have one political party going from calling it terrible and un-American to, quote, legitimate. Republicans rejected the chance to treat January 6th like that kind of other attack or follow, say, the precedent of a 9-11 investigation. Instead, they actually ousted the party members who stood up against the sedition. We all know they excommunicated people like Liz Cheney and Congressman Kinzinger, who had been, in Cheney's case, in their very leadership. And soon enough, the speaker who replaced McCarthy was falsely arguing January 6th defendants were being persecuted. He got himself in a scandal when he said he would hide the fugitives and blur their faces from DOJ. He backtracked on that, but as you can see on our chart, went on to defend them as, quote, innocent. This week, which is why this is back in the news, Johnson falsely claimed those people who stormed the barricades and clashed with police to get in were somehow innocent. He said that others who were walking through the Capitol were just kind of ended up there. He knows that claim is false because it wasn't open that day. And so Mike Johnson went from just pushing lawsuits to overturn Trump's loss, which, however misleading, is a activity that you can legally engage in. You are allowed to file losing lawsuits, even absurd ones in America. But he went from there to going well beyond that last speaker to openly making common cause with these convicted attackers. So um, I made a commitment uh, immediately after I got the gavel that we would start releasing that. Originally, we were trying to blur some of the faces to protect the innocent, you know, people who were just there and just happened to be walking through the building. And so here we are. People who happen to be walking through the building is a lie, which he knows. And again, you might not want to spend all your time living in a country where you have to compare Kevin McCarthy as the standard and Mike Johnson is below it. But this is why I'm showing you this tonight, that as the legal accountability on the top lane increases, which is a very real thing, on this bottom lane, you go from a speaker calling this un-American to a party calling it legitimate to the new speaker declaring them, quote, innocent. And then on the very far right-hand corner, 
You have the party again. As it hires people for the next six months heading into the November election, there are all these reports that their screening involves only taking election deniers. Help wanted, but election deniers only. And so party leaders now praise these insurrectionists as innocent heroes, even as the people in government face increasing and sometimes irreversible legal accountability. You may know several of these different points. We put them together this way, including on top of Speaker Johnson's outrageous and false claims this week to chart why the legal and the political are taking such disparate paths and what that means for America and this coming accountability election. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone, you hit search on the bottom right corner, you type in MSNBC, you click on the MSNBC app, you click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.